Fetterman. We then looked at Raymond Fetterman and his approaches to novel writing and the novel itself um, in terms of uh, this trajectory in French thought um, towards writing to Greasy Road, towards that post-World War II moment where uh, thinkers are, are, are wanting to, to um, remove um, bourgeois and class written notions of aesthetics from literature and reapproach language itself in a form that might be able to bring in a more democratic um, uh, uh, notion of, of what art itself is. And at the same time, at a restructured level of society itself. Um, so there are so many different thinkers that we could look at. Louis Althusser comes to mind um, as well. Uh, but Bart, um, when we see this influence on a creative writer like Raymond Fetterman, we see not only the fractured self of modernity, but we have at least four different voices going on in his text, uh, which is a novel that's about the creation of a novel itself. And I want to address some of the criticisms I think that the 21st century read readers have, especially some of my students when I've taught this book, um, uh, uh, around like the, the the racism and the sexism that comes up in the characters, um, one of the characters in the book. So we have we have a authorial voice and four voices sort of um, talking about and deliberating how they are going to write the novel. Um, we have the characters in the novel whose names keep changing um, as the authorial voices are um, in dialogue about. Uh, you know, what the character's experiences are, they somehow mimic it, on one level the autobiography of Raymond Fetterman, the Jewish um, French person who has come to the United States in the late 1940s, um, or who arrives in the United States and is surprised to see how many Black people there are in the United States and thinks at first he got on the wrong boat and has arrived in Africa. Um, who essentializes African American women? Who um, uh, has not had the character has not had sex at this point in their life, or or possibly has in a uh, a tryst on the boat um, uh, on the way over to the United States? But of course, his image of American women is completely built on cliches and stereotypes from a uh, drive-in movie or teen culture from the 1950s and 60s. And he over-sexualizes women. So he's sex, the character is sexist and racist, essentializing in terms of women's bodies um, uh, throughout the text itself. This is not something that we need to defend or apologize for um, or, 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 or make sorts of excuses for. And like, it is just there. Right. And uh, so this is the argument I'm making here is should not be confused with saying like, oh, this was just like Raymond Fetterman's time and people were racist or this is how they talk during that time. No, I think that Fetterman is drawing our attention to when we look at a structural level at language and thought, um, cartoonish and racially essentialized notions and sexist notions are part of the process, right? Uh, um, they exist in our own selves in terms of uh, the completely saturated inequity of the culture in which we live in. And he shows it in a kind of starkness and it's ugly, right? So uh, uh, there's a kind of realism at work, which feels it's so, sort of weird to talk about the realism of racial essentialism, because we know it doesn't have a real basis that it's socially constructed, right? This is the dominant thinking on race in the 21st century. There is no biological sort of notion of our grounding notion of of race, um, although there were attempts in the late nineteenth century and early twentieth century to have that sort of 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 approach to race, and uh, um, so what are we dealing with when we're looking at literature and we are uh, um, trying to analyze it in terms of race and racial construction? When we come into twenty twenty three in the United States, our literary culture is produce the modes of production are produced according to a broad discourse on diversity, equity, and inclusion, on notions of identity, whether we're talking about gender identity, sexual orientation, 
um, gender expression, uh, nationality, um, age, disability or ability, um, uh, uh, religion, whatever our identity categories are. We live in a moment where we have a large discourse on those categories and we could uh, we could approach them economically in terms of neoliberalism and all sorts of other literary strategies but what we don't want to do at least in this discourse is take a sort of ideological moment that we're in right now and cast that back on the past i don't think that that necessarily works at the same time this is not like i said a matter of sort of de um, defending um uh uh, racism or sexism as it exists in a previous author. Um, I think that what Fetterman is after, if we look at it in a literary theory and critical sense, um, uh, is something different than uh, an attempt to represent somebody um, as real or an attempt to represent somebody as um, uh, uh, as, as as morally upstanding. So we want to like pull our expectations of a text away from textuality and the production of textuality itself. But of course, this is partly what post-structuralism is about, is that, of course, we are constructing this at the same time. So when we interact with a text that has racism in it or sexism is in it, we are also in the process of constructing and dealing with that ourselves as the scripture reader that we are as well. We take the scripture reader idea and we apply it to Fetterman. He is developed a novel where he's talking about the creative process and the creative process is dealing with people and characters as ideas, as stereotypes, as figments of people's imagination and as essentialized racist and sexist tropes as well. So there is something about structuralism and post-structuralism as a discourse that precedes our more current discourse, whether we're talking about queer theory or whether we're talking about gender identity affect theory um, the theories that emerge um, in the late 20th century as well. And it's partly that post-structuralist discourse that pushes us in that direction to thinking about social construction itself. Um, and that's part of, of course, why I'm doing this series on structuralism, so that we can see all of this sort of stuff. Um, uh, if we think about coding in ChatGPT and the racism that's embedded in AI discourse, right? When we look back at these structural um, approaches to language and to literary theory, and we see that the, how that maps with the emergence of coding cultures, it gives us a way to analyze how racial essentialism might be built into the coding cultures that we have today in the United States as well. Okay, I'm going to turn now to Bakhtin to the dialogic imagination, particularly to this first essay in his book. Um, a couple of things to think about. So this essay is written in the late 1930s in Russia. Bakhtin, as a person, um, uh, grows up outside of and quickly moves to Odessa um, in Russia, then moves um, to Leningrad, then moves to Moscow, um, later on in his life, this is being written at a, a time in his life where he is um, about to lose a leg because he's had some physical um, issues going on in his life. Um, he was not, he kind of lived in obscurity and, and wasn't even sort of um, rediscovered within um, Soviet culture until the 1960s. And of course, not in West, Western or U.S. culture until the 1970s. And that's what I want us to think about here, because I've been giving these lectures in terms of French intellectual thought. Now we're dealing with a Russian writer who was writing earlier than some of the French writers that I've talked about in the past few uh, lecture videos, but who isn't received in the United States literary culture until uh, the late 70s and 80s. And so this is published in 1975. So we're dealing with different intersections of geography, of different national cultures. And I think that it is in that post-structural moment in the United States that we see a thinker like Bakhtin um, uh, arriving and why he's been received with such importance in U.S. literary culture. Um, so he's going to be dealing with the novel itself. And, and we might have to have more 
future videos on the novel, but this is why, I, of course, I wanted to have Fetterman as an example in our lecture series before getting to uh, Bakhtin here. Uh, he says that the study of the novel as a genre is distinguished by its peculiar difficulties. This is due to the unique nature of the object. The novel is the sole genre that continues to develop, that is as yet uncompleted. And so as a novel, as, as a genre, the novel is an open system. It is developing and progressing and changing and transforming all of the time. That's what characterizes it. Just like in the English language, the word novel means new. It is always dealing with something new. So if we were going to approach a new novel, like some of my students who are reading Jasmine Ward's um, book, Sing, Unburied Sing, if we were to approach that um, in, in uh, contradistinction, I guess, to a novel like Raymond Fetterman's Double or Nothing, we might look at the development of the novel and novel novel discourse and literary language as it exists in multi-ethnic U.S. literature of Jessamyn Ward versus um, uh, a multi-ethnic U.S. like Jewish writer who's writing in a U.S. context, but of course has come from France, like Fetterman in the early 70s and late 60s. I want my students to oftentimes see this if you're in a course that where we're reading one back to back to the next. The idea is that you can see a starkness of stylistic change and difference um, between these two writers. Um, uh, and that gives us a sense that the discourse of the novel or on the novel, like the theory of the novel changes over time because novels um, as, as a genre itself change over time. So when we come back to Bakhtin here, writing again in the late 1930s, he wants to distinguish the novel against these older genres of epic and tragedy, which come from oral culture. They precede even literature being written down. And so he's going to be talking about ancient culture, ancient Greek and Roman culture on the one hand. And on the other hand, remember, he's writing in the 20th century. He's writing in Soviet Union. Um, he's writing with a sense of Marxist um, approaches to structure and class on, um, and um, with the ability to like, how do you Think of something like a world proletariat where people speak very radically different languages, but uh, from a Marxist sort of sense, like that wants a more democratic approach to um, uh, uh, the, the global, um, the world worker um, as an entity, right, as a structural entity. Can we deal with something like a world worker as a proletarian? How do we deal with the fact that there are different languages that exist across the world as well? Um, and how does that interact with the ideology, excuse me, the ideology, the ideological structures of different national characters as they emerge in the post-World War II context, which of course it's like World War II hasn't hasn't ended by the time that he's writing this, but we see the Cold War developing after World War II and 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 uh, Russia, not just as a nation, um, but the Soviet Union. So uh, the idea of a lot of different um, entities like bigger than Russia. And so we kind of have to have a little bit of a mid 20th century context here. Of course, we see battles with um, over Ukraine and um, issues going on in the early 2020s when I'm making this video as well. Uh, uh, that, that we can keep think of, but the way that multi-ethnic might be showing up for someone like Bakhtin, um, we have it that sense in the United States, but because of the hegemony of white Euro-Christian and English-speaking culture in the United States, a lot of U U.S. citizens are monoglots. They only speak one language. And so Bakhtin and other um, Russian linguists are going to, like Roman Jakobson, for example, they're really going to be critical of the ways that linguistics has happened in the so-called West, um, where people have not compared enough languages together. Um, and that is definitely coming out of uh, a moment of thinking about what and who constitutes something like um, different entities within the Soviet Union, which of course is a backdrop. Um, now, um, th there are ways that Bakhtin's work gets um, suppressed within um, the culture of the Soviet Union as well, and the ways that we might read 
him as subversive to some of the conditions, especially under Stalin in the Soviet Union. So I do not, I do not want to um, just cast Mikhail Bakhtin as a kind of Soviet, um, uh, uh, um, but also maybe not cast him as so subversive that he just becomes a hero for for um, some sort of like liberal Western capitalism capitalist type of ideology as well. I think he's a richer thinker than all of those categories. Um, but but of course, when we put it in the structuralist tradition where Marxism and Marxist approaches are being taken very seriously by French leftist intellectuals, that's a different context than what we've had in the United States with the development of the Cold War, the Red Scare, McCarthyism in the mid 20th century, and, 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 and the, the complete demonization of any kind of communist ideology, in, at least in our popular culture in the United States. So we need to be a little bit more intellectually flexible about different ideologies, different political strategies um, in an international politics sense when we look at a thinker like Bakhtin. So, okay, he's going to be talking in a very broad historic sense from ancient times, but he's also a mid 20th century writer. He says that um, these old genres of epic and tragedy, tragedy have become hardened. They're no longer flexible. The novel, which we can see early examples of it emerging as writing culture develops in antiquity. Um, there's a big shift towards the culture of writing that establishes modernity, right? The fact that we have passports and visas and ID cards um, uh, and all of the passcodes for our computers that verify our identity. We live in a document-centered um, uh, existence that was just emergent in um, this, the, the ancient Greek and ancient Roman times. Um, but uh, that shift to writing was going to give us like glimpses at what will be novelistic discourse, as he calls it. He says on this first page here, of all major genres, only the novel is younger than writing and the book. It alone is organically receptive to the new forms of mute perception, that is, to reading. But of course, uh, but of critical importance here is the fact that the novel has no canon of its own. It's not closed off, right? Um, only individual examples of the novel are historically active, not a generic canon as such. Studying other genres is analogous to studying dead languages. Studying the novel, on the other hand, is like studying languages that are not only alive, but still young. But think about Ferdinand de Saussure, and how uh, he approaches studying uh, Proto-Indo-European. We don't have Proto-Indo-European. We know it sort of exists, but there's no sort of uh, way that we can study it as a system or as an entity of the, in and of itself. We have to study it through speech. We have to study it later on in a semiotic sense. We study language through gesture itself. And so Bakhtin is going to push that notion very hard um, with his notion of utterance in my computer's battery is dying, so I got a plug in here. Um, uh, so his notion of utterance is going to come along with a concept that he calls heteroglossia, which is different languages. He will use the term heteroglossia and polyglossia. Polyglossia means many languages. It's the way that we might explore the difference at an idiomatic language between different languages. So again, um, or here's an example I've used at times, um, um, that's not my cup of tea, an idiom in the English language, right? That's, like, that's something I don't prefer. But we can have the same idiom in French, like, ce n'est pas ma tasse du thé, right? Nothing phonologically really corresponds well across those um, two examples. I mean, T and T, yes, we have um, the kind of uh, attention to uh, shifts in vowel usage that happen throughout European languages as well. And there's a similar syntactic structure that French and English have because there are two languages having a relationship. 
um, the general industry who doesn't speak French doesn't know what saying in French much as to the meaning, but we have the kind of collection of that as an inner and that might um uh, that we might be able to speak of as kind of fossils to the languages. And so we can think about the character of linguistics all the way from the down to the commons and up to the idiom of the sentence level or the fox level, and then to the cultural level as well. Like we were dealing with this, I mean, we get so much looking at the fraud of the structure, for example. So the structure was across in so many different areas, and that's why it makes it so theoretically uh, enriched to a distribution of the community. Um, uh, back to Epic and the novel here. Um, he says, uh, the novel on page four, it's the only genre that was born in the first in the new era of world history, and therefore it's deeply akin to that era, whereas the other major genres entered that era as already fixed forms as an inheritance, and only now are they adapting some better and some worse. So it's not like, like, like epics and, um, comedies or uh, um, uh, tragedies don't still exist, but they adapt to the new pictures. But the novel is different because what the novel does is it parodies other genres, as he says on page five. And novelistic discourse has this ability to mimic higher forms of discourse and invert them. Um, so parody, irony, all of the gestures of the the jester, right? The joker, the fool, as we've seen in lectures of mine on the Twelfth Night, for example, um, where we see in that emergent early modern culture, the license that the jester has to speak, right? The, li the license that the fool has to crit criticize the king and uh, operates in a kind of realm of free speech um, such that the Puritan uh, um, characters in Twelfth Night will criticize and want to censor the fool but another other voices come in and say no the fool can't be censored um the entire emphasis on a culture of comedy and parody that can invert the fool and the king that is so much a part of carnivalesque culture um from europe this is something that bakhtin is obsessed with in his dissertation and in his work on the early modern um, french writer rabelais for example but we see it in shakespeare as well of course the novel isn't the primary form in shakespearean english it develops later on um as as the kind of premier form of of modern literature and takes over from an earlier sense of poetry so the novel as an art form is not high literature um, in the 1700s and the 1800s, it start, it becomes that later on. Um, and it's distinguished between what was considered, from a high art sense, um, uh, poetry. And this makes sense then when we look at Bakhtin and we say over on page 10, and he says something like he's been comparing um, Tom Jones and English novel. He's comparing novels across different languages. Um, and again, giving us something that might be like we now call comparative literature. Um, and he says um, the novel that has these characteristics, he, he likes listing in threes. And he says that one is that the novel shouldn't be read po as poetic, um, at least as the word poetic is used in other genres of imaginative literature. The hero of the novel should not be read as heroic in either the epic or tragic sense of the word. He should combine in himself negative as well as positive features of low as well as lofty, ridiculous, as well as serious. And three, the hero should not be portrayed as an already um, completed and unified um, a person. For the novel should become for the contemporary world what the epic was in the ancient world. An idea that Blankenberg expressed very precisely, and that was later repeated by Hegel. So it's a new form. And what comes with the novel then, over here on um, page 11, is uh, um, uh, these features um, of the genre itself. It's stylistic three-dimensionality, which is linked with multi-languaged consciousness realized in the novel, the radical change it affects in the temporal coordinates of the literary image, the new zone opened up, up opened by the novel for structuring literary images, 
different than poetry, he says, um, namely the zone of maximal contact with the present, with contemporary reality and again, open-endedness. And we could think about this as he maneuvers on to talk about national languages um, with a, um, a, a more recent book by Benedict Anderson, um, um, where he's looked into the inquiry, he's inquired into um, uh, the, the development of so-called vulgar languages in early modern lang uh, English and, and the, the way that cultures shift according to that and the development of national languages in, in the more modern sense. Um, I think that that, that, that um, uh, Bakhtin and Anderson are sort of like Anderson's writing that, that um, his work in the early 1980s, late 70s at the same time that this, this work has come out to as well. So there, we see some cross themes there in a book that's not always thought of um, in terms of, um, uh, of literature, but imagined communities, the book that I'm thinking about there, um, uh, um, definitely corresponds uh, on a theoretical level to what's going on here. Um, the epic uh, is a um, different genre that is going to be contrasted here with uh, the novel. And um, so uh, Bakhtin is going to treat um, the epic as, as a kind of, um, uh, as, as a backdrop to sort of distinguish the novel from. So on page 13, he says that what characterizes the epic is that it's a national epic of the past in Goethe's and Schiller's terminology, the absolute past and in Goethe. Um, or sorry, um, and it serves as the subject for the epic, the national tradition, not the personal experience and the free thought that grows out of it serves the source of the epic. An epic is constituted by an, an absolute epic distance that separates it's the epic world from the contemporary reality. That is from the time in which the singer or the author and his audience lives. The epic has a time of firsts and bests. Um, the epic is oftentimes the kind of completeness, although it operates in oral culture as well. So as he will say later on in this chapter, um, that uh, when we see the Iliad, the performance of the Iliad as, a, as an oral performance, just like a tragedy, the audiences in the ancient cultures know the bigger mythic cycle, and they know that we see we're only giving you a glimpse. So what, we don't need to know the end of the Trojan War or what happens to Achilles at the end of the Iliad, because um, we're going to end with Hector, this moment of, uh, of uh, um, the death of Hector, right? Um, and uh, uh, so because there's already a kind of culture at work that we just see a glimpse of, of that, that there isn't the pressure on the writer of the epic to necessarily tell every single aspect. Um, also, we see, we, we see um, um, characters being very external. It's not to say that we don't catch glimpses of like an internal monologue or um, internal thought. Um, in, in a character like Odysseus, for example, in Homer's Odyssey, but that characterization is, is, is in, in its emergent stages um, when we see the written down version of the Odyssey. And in this sense, Bakhtin as a thinker is very similar um, to other critical theorists like Adorno and Horkheimer who write in dialogue, uh, the, the dialectic of enlightenment, they've returned back to Homer in an essay from that book, in a chapter in that book. And they're looking at the way that they can think about European modernity and the development of bourgeois society, for example. They can see kernels of it all the way going back to Odysseus. So notice how these German thinkers um, have a similar approach to a Russian thinker like Mikhail Bakhtin here as well, in the sense that he's casting his gaze back all the way to the Greeks and also saying and talking about the present itself. Um, so a similar um, uh, um, method there in their gaze at the history of literature and the novel. Um, uh, Bakhtin on page 14 is going to say that um, the space between these different genres is filled with national tradition to portray an event on the same time and value plane as oneself and one's contemporaries and an event that is therefore based on personal experience and thought 
is to undertake a radical revolution and to step out of the world of the epic and into the world of the novel. So um, the novel brings something new again. Um, uh, in contrast to the epic, he says on page 15, um, uh, uh, the novel is determined by experience, knowledge, practice, and the future. It's not, it's not a, separated from the past, right? In the era of Hellenism, so in the Greek era, a closer contact with the heroes of the Trojan epic cycle began to be felt. Epic is already being transformed into the novel. Epic. So it's it, we see kernels of it in in um, written down versions of of epics, right? Epic material is transposed into novelistic material into precisely that zone of contact that passes through the intermediate stages of familiarization and laughter. Laughter is going to be very important here when the novel becomes the dominant genre. Epistemology, or the study of the nature of knowledge, becomes the dominant discipline. Then goes on to talk about temporality and how temporality is going to be a feature of the novel. We think about Proust and the remembrance of things past or in search of lost time, depending on how that um, novel is translated in English. Um, the epic is going to be dealing with tradition and, and, and it's going to be conservative in the way that it presents culture. Um, he says, as we've already pointed out, the epic past is locked into itself and walled off from all subsequent times by an impenetrable boundary, isolated, and this is most important, from the eternal present of children and descendants in which the epic singer and his listeners are located, which figures in as an event in their time lives and becomes the epic performance. So if so, some of you may have watched my lectures, I gave 24 lectures or more on Homer's Odyssey in the summer of 2022. And there are moments I think that we could look at internality or an internal psychology. And there are moments that we can even think that the bard who's telling the story of Odysseus is somehow Odyssean or perhaps Odysseus himself because he's so like, grand. he's great, seems to be grandstanding and un, un, unable to truly critique the great Odysseus. So he's like talking about his own exploits. There are ways to, I think, I, 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 or, or moments in the text that, that, that show that the storytelling or that the orality when, when Odysseus becomes the storyteller in the middle of the Odyssey, for example, he becomes the bard. And so the commentary on the bards and what a bard does and protecting the bard's discourse, like um, when, when somebody wants to criticize the bard, we see that um, uh, the protection of the storyteller showing up again in later um, literature like Shakespeare as well, especially in Twelfth Night, which has been on my mind in recent months uh, here. So um, he says on page 20, the present is something transitory. It is flow. It is an eternal communication without beginning or end. Um, it is denied in authentic conclusiveness and consequently lacks essences as well. Um, uh, um, alongside, on page 21 over here, alongside direct representation, laughing and li at living reality, there flourish parody and travesty of all high genres and of all lofty models embodied in national myth. And that is what novels bring. Um, it's not like there, it's the only place that it exists because in stage performances, again, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night comes to mind we see the, especially in the early modern era, a complete sort of shift from vul into vulgarized national languages. And with that, there's this, this way of discourse where we can have Shakespeare representing the loftiest royalty and the grave diggers to go to him, for example. And with that also the sort of carnivalesque traditions of um, early modern Europe where somebody is king for a day, for example, where there's a reversal of fortunes in terms of fortunes wheel, for example. And with novelistic discourse, it's not just that we can mimic high or lofty discourse, it's that we can parody and make fun of it. And from that, laughter comes. From that, irony comes. He says, though, that if we look back to the ancient Greeks, that even the fool as represented by Socrates, the philosopher, that the, the that because he takes on this error, 
of foolishness and ignorance and not knowing that produces his Socratic method of questioning, that that is an early form of this shift towards novelistic discourse. So it's not only an emergence of something that happens in the last five or 600 years, but we see again um, uh, that it's emerging over time. He says on page 25 that the figure of Socrates himself is characteristic of the genre. He is an outstanding example of heroization in novelistic prose, so very different from the epic heroization. It is finally a profoundly profoundly characteristic, and for us, this is the, of utmost importance that we have laughter, Socratic irony, the entire system of Socratic degradations combined with serious lofty, and for the first time, truly free investigation of the world of man and of human thought. That's what he means about the democratization that novel, novelistic discourse brings um, so we can think about this in terms of heteroglossia and in terms of the notion of the dialogic. Um, just like Saussure says that we cannot see a whole language and that we must approach it through terms of speech, um, through utterance, Bakhtin is going to say, we see the development of dialogue happening through emergent characters and emergent identities in the process of the dialogue itself. So it's not like you have pre-given entities in the way that you might have written philosophical dialogues in the early modern period where it's like, oh, well, we have this famous character talking to this famous character, and you have preconceived notions. He's talking about, no, the actual present moment of interacting with another person who you may not totalize in your conception of them, whose every word and utterance is producing something new in this very contemporary moment. And I think that that's what he wants to sort of, how he's characterizing sort of the 20th century version of um, the conditions of what we might later call globalization, where we've seen like, like many different cultures sort of interacting with each other with their different traditions, with their different languages, polyglossia, but at the same time, heteroglossia, which is maybe we might think of the different registers of language itself. And we look back to a time where, where it's kind of mixed up. So like, if you think about the way European music is written down in the early modern period, where it's just lines, there are no staffs, um, there are no key signatures. Um, so when you have like what a key signature becomes, like the, the, the treble clef with it, which is a letter G, which shows you where G is on the on the on the treble clef versus the F clef of bass clef, right? Um, we see with the emergence of do emergence of document-centered culture, you see this kind of rigidity and emphasis on measuring and mapping that we can think of with modern forms of colonization and colonialism. In 20th century music, you see a push back away from that towards serialization out of key centers with people like Arnold Schoenberg, right? We could also think of a painter like Vasily Kandinsky and um, his famous essay concerning the spiritual and art from the early 20th century, where he's talking about that he's pushing back against classicalism or classicism in, um, uh, in uh, visual art where people are trying to mimic the ways that Greeks and Romans had figured bodies, right? And Roman and Greek statues, which we see as the, the white statues, but were painted at the time, right? To look much more realistic than we might um, have been mimicking them. And so this whole Renaissance moment of trying to have a rebirth of classical or antiquity knowledge, um, Vasily Kandinsky says that's castrated art, right? And from the notion of castrated art, which doesn't speak to our times, um, uh, that from that moment, he's developing into what we would call abstraction in um, his uh, 20th century painting. Um, he's not the only 20th century or modern painter to do that. Um, but he is. Um, I've, I'll just have to, he's not the only painter to do that, but uh, my camera cut stopped working there. But he uh, is, 
uh, one who articulates things really, really well um, in terms of uh, the fact that we have his essay writing and his, his collaborations and dialogue with uh, um, uh, Schoenberg himself, the musician as well. So uh, I'm having some technical difficulties there, but I think the recording is still going. So I'm going to keep going here for a little bit. Um, with the emergence of novelistic language, we get in novelistic discourse, we get the author, the authorial position. He says on page 28, this new positioning of the author must be considered one of the most important results surmounting epic or hierarchical distance. The enormous formal compositional and stylistic implications of this new position of the author has for the scientific, the specific evolution of the novel as a genre and require no further exp explanation. Um, uh, and so we get with the novelistic discourse, the emphasis on the author as a character, the author as an entity, the author as somebody who's orchestrating a bunch of different voices who work heteroglossically or, or polyglossically. Um, and as well, when we get to post-structuralism and the idea of the death of the author, we see the same sort of formulation that's happened in the early modern era, the same sort of, the early modern era, excuse me, uh, we see a not only fragmentation, um, but the upending and the reversals that constitute characters of the fool and the king in uh, Shakespeare, right? Um, uh, the upending of the notions of art, hardcore notions of the sacred, for example, for dem more democratic approaches to even spirituality, the emergence of so-called secularization um, as an idea. Um, the uprooting of authority in terms of like kingly authority or priestly authority that we see in the early modern era is revisited upon the identity of a unified authorial voice um, in the post-structuralist sense. And so that deconstruction process is something that happens throughout time and it happens rather naturally, um, as Jacques Derrida would say. So it's not to say that we deconstruct when we approach a text, is that when we look into text and textuality itself, we see a more fluid and evolving process that deconstructs its own self as we are looking at it. Um, and it does, in the kind of 20th century physics sense, it does the, the, the idea that you are an, an observer or a scripter means that you are a reader as scripter, right? That, that we are playing a part in the process of the creation of the text itself. And when, again, to come back to um, Raymond Fetterman, or, or when you see uh, morally reprehensible ideas <laughs> And, and texts that, that have racism or sexism. It's like, yes, it's like, like to think about an ism or racism or sexism, to think about it as institutionalized is already kind of assuming a lot of things, ideas that come with structuralist analyses that look at the world. If we think about the patriarchy or critiquing white masculine patriarchy, for example, right? That's definitely looking at, in a structural sense at what this idea of patriarchy is. And to what extent can we subvert it, right? To what extent can I sort of um, deal with the inherent sexism um, that happens from growing up and being encultured in a patriarchal society, right? So what is the work of decolonization as we might put it in a post-colonial setting or an indigenous studies setting, what is the work that we do, um, that we can do, to what extent can we will or willfully do that kind of work? Um, these are all questions that will come up um, in, and they are very current questions for us in terms of literature and society um, as well. But I'm giving this lecture series on structuralism so we can see a sense of the, the historical changes for how this happens. And when we look back to Fetterman and, and, and now we see this kind of cartoonish nature or racially essentialist nature, it's not like he's doing it with the intention of being of, 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 of being derogatory towards African-American people. Um, he's showing how thought works itself and how thought does very, um, uh, uh, violent things, I would say, in Levinas's sense, in the way that thoughts will totalize, essentialize other people as well. 
Um, and so we want to bring that kind of uh, trajectory of being able to see not just a structuralist way of looking at the world, but the post-structuralist ways of how that those notions aren't fixed in time and 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 how we might think of something like social construction, right? The social construction of gender, the social construction of race and identity that all so much saturates our current discourse. It all is very much emerging from post-structural discourse of the late 60s and 70s. And that's why it's important for us to keep in mind that more recent history that's informing our own discourse today when we do aesthetic, literary, or theoretical, philosophical study. Um, back to uh, the essay here, I want to kind of close down here. He says on page 34, the individual in high distance genres is an individual of absolute past and of the distance age. As such, he is a finished and completed being. This has been accomplished on a lofty heroic level, but what is complete is also something uh, hopelessly, hopelessly ready-made. He is all there, but be from beginning to end, he coincides with himself, he is absolutely equal to himself. Again, think about Raymond Fetterman and the fractured death of the author, multiple selves that constitute the neurotic space of the traumatized um, Jewish individual who has come to the United States um, not speaking any English and is only interacting with a, another culture through these kind of almost structuralist, rigid, essentialized cultural ideas as they're learning a new culture, right? Um, uh, so again, the, the post-structuralist moment is not exactly new. It's a radicalization of the earlier forms of fracturing, of, or fracturing that constitute modernity itself. Um, uh, he says um, of the author on page 35, um, everything in that other person, the author, is able to say about him, he can say about himself and vice versa. Again, if you think back to the ways that autobiography and fiction collide in post-structural and um, post-modern literature, this is a way that the literary theories are informing the creative or generative processes of creative writers. Um, now, I know that a lot of people um, don't encounter literature this way because we are still shaped very much in terms of 19th century ideas about realism and literature. And current um, fiction writers like Brian Evanson is one of them um, in uh, an essay from the early 2000s called Notes on Fiction and Philosophy, um, talks about this difficulty that our our a general readership in the United States has, where well, we're still working very much from 19th century notions of storytelling and realism, even when we watch films that have people with superpowers in them or Marvel stuff. Um, their element, like we gauge and judge often in terms of a kind of reality um, notion that surrealism and that um, experimental fiction has gotten rid of. Um, we want narrative continuity, and that comes with the development of Hollywood cinema, for example. Um, uh, 180 degree rules of, of angle and that have shaped the ways that we, and expectations that we have of a text. So much of textual culture today in the United States is being produced alongside the ideological conditions of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, of inclusive excellence, as the American Academy of Colleges and Universities says. So when we're thinking about looking at texts, oftentimes my students want to go over like, it's like, okay, let's do a feminist analysis. Let's do a gender analysis or a queer theorist analysis or um, a Marxist analysis of films uh, or, or, or texts. Um, uh, a non-binary or transgender um, uh, reading of a text, an African-American reading of a text, right? The fracturedness of identity has been sort of reconstituted re as a force of control, I think in terms of what Michel Foucault might call governmentality, um, and creates conditions that, um, uh, that, that are, that produce the ways that we interact with um, other people in the world today. So even um, someone who I would argue is like very sexist and racist, like Donald Trump, still has to speak the language of identity 
and his speeches to address when he was in power um, to address uh, the state of, in the State of the Union addresses themselves, right? So the political conditions around our current ideologies are also the conditions that are employed when we produce literature um, uh, and, and aesthetic products of our current culture today. And by looking back a little bit historically, I think that we can get a little bit more of a critical sense of all of this stuff, of, of how all of this stuff works. And then we can also um, sort of keep pushing on the levels of um, politics that we might want to have, like towards democratic society, for example, or towards a critique of patriarchal masculinity. On the other hand, we can push towards that without just sort of falling into ideological trappings where we're just um, um, uh, parroting other voices or just repeating other voices. So another um, sort of trajectory of post-structuralism that we will want to get to um, our notions of repetition versus difference, to use the title of a Gilles Deleuze book. When we're thinking about repetition versus difference, there's the repetition of identity categories that keep mirroring or mimicking or reacting to an earlier one. Um, we see this a lot in gender discourse currently and new gender identity categories, um, for example. There's repetition and then there's also difference. Right, um, and I think that trans. If we were to talk, talk about trans discourse, this would like especially um, like the difference between somebody who's transitioning um, sexually or transsexual, or somebody who's non-binary who's completely resisting. So, and the way that that might map onto earlier ideas of queerness and queer theory. So that's a. These are later sort of developments in theoretical discourse, but I think that looking back to structuralism and post-structuralism, we see the emergence of 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 our availability to think and discuss this sort of stuff. Just like when we look back to post-structural discourse, we can see the emergence of, of what we now see as coding culture in chat GPT and computers across the board in different coding languages because they work on a structural level, but they have a lot of internal rigidity and rules. So how we, are we able to see the cartoonish notions of sex, sexism of racial essentialism being embedded into our, our AI today, right? Well, we can see that when we look back to a novel like Fetterman's Double or Nothing, and then we can come into a more recent novel like Jasmine Ward's Sing Unburied Sing, and we can look at the history and trajectory of the development of the novel as a genre and, and, and sort of um, work with emerging categories and ways to um, interact with language, but also if you're wanting to be a theorist or a creative writer, ways to produce language and and and, and um, uh, uh, think about how we might manipulate language to what extent we can. Um, what can we get away with um, in terms of of change, right? By the the how do we interact politically, um, intellectually, artistically in our societies and make meaning for ourselves. Uh, towards the end here, he says, um, one of the basic internal themes of the novel is precisely the theme of inadequ the inadequacy of the hero's fate and the situation of the hero himself. The individual is either greater than his fate or less than his condition as a man. He cannot become once and for all a clerk, a landowner, a merchant, a fiancé, a le jealous lover, a father, and so forth. And this is exactly what, if we go back to Fetterman, like what he's struggling with, the authorial voices are debating with the so with the character of Boris or whoever's jock Boris, all of the different names of this character that they're kind of making up, but then also as part of an autobiographical memory, um, um, we can't have one particular identity category. There's something about the fracture that can't constitute the whole of what a self is. Again, comparing back to Roland Barthes and the idea of a menu, what's on a menu and all of the different um, ingredients that a restaurant might have available for certain dishes, dishes can is, is are forms of repetition of the same ingredients. What happens if we change the entire menu? What if we ch change the whole ingredient structure? Um, then what are we dealing with? Then we're dealing with something more like difference, um, or difference in the ways that um, Jacques Derrida, who we will talk more about in later lectures, um, from this, um, uh, um, wants to theorize. 
um, the process of difference and change itself. Um, not as something that we can just invoke with will, but something that happens um, and something that we pay, play a part in as, as observers and readers of literature, as the reader scripture. Um, and we confront racism, we confront sexism, we confront any kind of moral reprehension that we might see in our text as we're constructing them and maneuvering and thinking about the ideological structures and can, social conditions that um, permeate and um, help generate our worlds today. Um, again, he says there's no canon for the novel. It is as a genre open-ended and it's constituted by heteroglossia, um, different registers of voice, polyglossia, different languages, code meshing of different languages, um, dialogue, not dialogue of preconceived entities, but a dialogue of somebody who I don't know when I'm interacting with and the dialogue is emerging in the moment, just like back to Ferdinand de Saussure saying that we must study language at the individual level because we don't have access to an earlier full version of something like productivity. And where we think about cultural difference, where we think about linguistic difference, gender difference, gender fluidity, racial difference, racial fluidity, the social construction of race, all of that sort of stuff um, becomes available to us in discourse um, after this sort of post-structural moment this in the 20th century. I'm gonna end that here and um, hopefully the video works with the, the shift in the, um, my external camera cracking out in the beginning there um, or in the middle of my video. Have a good day, evening, morning, whenever, uh, wherever you are. Thanks for watching this and support us on Patreon if you so please.